afternoon, everyone. Uh, just check you can all hear me okay. Uh, I'm Ben Woodhouse here with Sosta. Um, we'll just stand over in the back corner. Uh, thank you for the great introduction. So I am one of the performance engineers at Sosta. So it's my job day to day to deliver the performance testing. Uh, as such, what better person to talk you through the continuous integration, how that works with tests when I do it every day with, with a number of our customers. So user expectations have changed um, over the last five years or, or continuously since you know, the, the internet has come up and become a household uh, piece of technology. But uh, the impatient consumerism now means that if your application doesn't work right first time, customers are very intolerant and they will very quickly drop you and go somewhere else. Uh, and with the advent of mobile, it now means that your application is everywhere, and if your application isn't everywhere, then it, it needs to be everywhere, because somebody else's will be. So users are now expecting this, and it's, it's getting more and more difficult to, to, to sort of, uh, to sort of um, get away with the old development cycles, the old test cycles, the old long, long drawn out software development life cycle. Um, and an app can take off, or a site can take off, and a bit of social media interest can now mean that you've got an unprecedented scale of people trying to hit your site all at the same time. So you've got to be ready for that, and it, it no longer is it a couple of thousand people, it could be millions, and it could be overnight, it could be based on a news story or, a, or an event that drives that. And again, the complexity is increasing as well. We're getting more and more composite apps, third-party plugins, services, APIs, it's growing and growing, and because everybody wants to integrate with everything, there's more and more complexity and more and more places where things can go wrong. Finally, uh, rapid delivery. So this is what everybody needs to be pushing towards now, and it's that agile development, the continuous delivery, and the DevOps, and, and that's why everybody's here today. This is why this conference is happening, is to drive that continuous development, continuous testing, continuous improvement of all of our applications. So uh, I'll let this build slowly. I'll keep it. Uh, I'll, I'll keep you not having to read too much on the screen. Uh, so, what is the purpose of continuous delivery, and and why would we have that? Uh, the idea is there's small batch sizes. You don't save everything up for a big release anymore. You'd start to test things in small batches, incremental improvements, incremental uh, releases, meaning that. You can test each thing individually, make sure everything's right, and get it out to the market more quickly. Uh, comprehensive version control. Now, this is needed because you'll have so many people working on different things that you need that comprehensive version control in order to uh, you know, make sure that you know where your app is, where your app is going to be, and to make sure that everything's tested and everything works together. Then we need automation. So manual testing is a long process. Manual testing takes a lot of time. Manual testing lends itself for a lot of errors, human errors. Uh, we're all prone to them. Uh, just look at the stain on my shirt from lunch. I mean, errors happen. Um, continuous feedback. What we need here is that continuous loop uh, so that once it's gone live, you know what's happening, you know how, the, how it's reacting once it's gone live and you know how to further develop that, how to further change that. That continuous feedback loop means you'll always be improving and always be pushing forwards. Emphasis on working builds. So you always want to uh, test what you build. Build, sorry, um, build, build the new feature, test every feature and test every release to make sure that everything is working and fix every bug. That's the important thing. And when you're doing it in small batches, you're finding these bugs earlier in the process. And the cost of fixing a bug earlier in the process is a lot less than right on the last line, right on the last day when you're about to launch a product. And consistent environments. Uh, with the cloud these days, there's, there's no reason why you can't bring up multiple environments, why you can't control and manage those environments from dev through test, through stage, through production. And the cost of this doesn't have to be big because you can manage it, only bring these up when you need them up. And, and just to make, to make sure that you're managing it properly. Uh, finally, collaboration. Uh, so often it's been a case of them versus us. I'm, I'm in test, I'm always being told that, well, no, that isn't a bug. Well, we're here, 
here to help. We're not here to, to dish your work. You know, <laughs> we, everybody's wor working towards that, that end goal of a, of a great product that works. And with DevOps, you need devs, testers, and ops all to be singing from the same hymn sheet, all to have that same final goal in mind. And by having them all working together collaboratively and earlier in the process, that happens a lot better. So uh, at a recent similar event, we, uh, we put out a poll here at Sosta and, uh, to understand what people are doing when it comes to continuous integration. Uh, as you can see here, we're over 65%. Uh, people are either currently in it or uh, on, the, on the cusp of in implementing continuous integration. It's a very hot topic, and it, it is the way the market is moving. Uh, I struggle to see who the 14.3% are personally. Right, apps are evolving, but testing hasn't. And, and this is the big paradigm shift that's needed now. Uh, the way applications are developed, it's not just for 5,000 people or 10,000 people. This can scale, and it needs to scale, and it needs to scale in a matter of weeks and affordably. And with the cloud and with other resources available to do this a lot more quickly, it's, it's, it baffles me why more people don't do it. Um, the other thing is brand reputation. I mean. They talk about affordability on there, but can you afford for your app not to be in the marketplace? Or can you afford for your app to fail? Uh, it's, it's quite easy to see these scathing things all over Twitter starting to trend when things don't go right for application launches. Testing has always been the bottleneck. Uh, everybody, everybody sees testing as the bottleneck, but quite often that was because it was right at the end of the software development life cycle. So everybody else delayed and then Everyone's waiting to go live until test is completed. So uh, what's been missing? Uh, this is where Sosta comes in. This is the Sosta tool set. So mobile test automation. Uh, uh, I haven't got the most recent stats, but I know uh, when we launched touch test back about two years ago, over 80% of mobile testing was manual process. And manual processes take a long time. That, you, know, you can't leverage repeatability. You can't leverage that continuous testing. Otherwise, you'd have a team bigger than this room testing constantly on the applications. Real test devices. Uh, previously, people have had to use simulators or log on to a device somewhere and try and use it with pixel mapping and, and optical recognition. Uh, with Sosta, we, uh, we work a little differently. And I'll come on to that a little bit later. But if, you're, if your application is going to be running on real devices, why aren't you testing on real devices? Performance testing. Not quite rendered right there. Uh, performance testing. A, a lot of, uh, for a lot of companies, this is an afterthought. But if people have these huge surges, these huge amounts of interest, and your site can't handle it, what does that do to the brand reputation? It's often seen as the, you know, the, the black sheep of testing and that people really don't understand it, people don't want to embrace it, and it's just stuck on the end of the life cycle as, as a tick in a box. But it really is more important than that. And solid integration. Now, this could be integration in terms of a mobile suite with a, a, a web performance suite, or this could be integration with your uh, development teams and with your continuous integration. So your development with Jenkins, so that you would go away checking your code at night. From that, it would trigger that to download if it's an app instrument, run a, uh, a set of automated tests overnight, to come in in the morning, and your development teams know what's passed, what's failed, and what they need to be working on for the following day. So software testing isn't anything out of the ordinary, or software development isn't anything out of the ordinary. And we call this laying the foundation here. But what we can see is it's the same in, in any process. So you've got a factory line. You'll, you'll create an object. You will build the object. You'll test whether it works. You'll performance test whether it works to find the breaking points. And then it will go out into the real world, and you'll get feedback. And it will be an iterative process. You'll release a new model each year around September, if you're Apple. Uh, the same thing works with software. You will come in. You will build your application. You'll validate that it works functionally. Your performance test to check that it works under load in the same way that, uh, and in a way that is acceptable to an end user. 
You will then look at what happens once it's gone live. You'll assess whether it's been successful or not. And then that will feed in again for unit testing code, rebuilding, and so on and so on. So when it comes to mobile test automation, there are a number of things to, uh, to think about. You need rapid and accurate test development. Uh, it's not just a case of clicking through a website or clicking through an application anymore. Things are getting more complicated. There's gestures, there's pinches, there's zooms, there's pans, there's shakes recently. Uh, then you need something that's reliable and maintainable. There's no point in putting in the effort to create automated tests that can only be used once because they're brittle and they break. You need it to be re reliable, maintainable, so that that initial effort can then, you can reap the rewards for, for months and years to come. Then we need the stability across the mobile OS platforms. So I know most people in this room, if they're developing for mobile, will have a different team for iOS and a different team for Android. But regardless of that, you've got a large ecosystem, even within iOS, it's heavily controlled. You've got iPads of different si screen sizes, different resolutions. You've got iPhones with different screen sizes and resolutions. So you need that stability. You need to be able to write it once and test it across everything in that platform. Then you also need to know how the devices are holding up. What's the point in functionally testing these, going, OK, I can see what's happening, but if that's maxing out the CPU, maxing out the RAM, or is, is talking unnecessarily over data, users aren't going to accept that in a real life situation where they've got multiple apps open. Then finally, the real-time feedback via continuous integration. If you're running these tests every night, every time you're checking in code, sometimes more than once a day, you're running this full suite of tests against it. And you're getting that fed back to the development teams and to, to all the various teams that have you know, a, a stake in the product. It means that you can really drive that, that faster development and the, the better quality of your product. So within Sosta, uh, the way we do this is quite often with private device clouds. This could be a, a fully managed device cloud installed behind the firewall inside your network. Now, when we say about testing on real devices, yes, this is a rack of real devices there because we want you testing on the devices that the customers are going to have. Now, obviously, that sounds like some, some sort of an outlay there, but it, it's not purely limited to the, the automated testing. And what we mentioned at the bottom is it can be used for manual testing as well. And the uh, technology we use allows people to remotely access the devices and perform manual tests on there as well. As much as I'll talk about automation and automation speeding things up, there is inevitably still going to be manual testing. You can't eradicate all manual testing in these situations. The key thing to think about is to learn from these. If you're running a manual test more than once, then that's something you want to think about automating. Uh, the other things here are you know, online access for all of your teams. Everybody can access the device rack, the device lab. People can be testing two different things at, at once if they're using different devices. Uh, there's 24 by 7 remote access to those devices as well. So moving on to the performance testing side of things now. Uh, this is something I was talking about at lunch for those at my table. Uh, were the validations from development to production. The, the key thing I'd like everyone to take away from, from this at the moment is try and push test as far left as you can for performance testing, test in the test lab. It doesn't have to be full end-to-end -end business processes. You can test it at a modular level still to get an understanding of that performance earlier. Bugs are far cheaper and far easier to fix earlier in the life cycle. But what we're also saying is don't just do your testing in the test lab. Don't just have dev do the test of their own stuff. You need to, to push that into the staging. And then if possible, and, and we highly recommend it, and I do it with a lot of my customers, is out into production. Because if you look at all the things up on there that come out in production, you've got your DNS routing, you've got CDM file placement. If, you, if you're loading from multiple geographies, you've got network bandwidth. These are all things that wouldn't get found out if you're testing in a very hived off staged environment that's hidden behind the firewall. And these are things that can really affect the, the performance for your end users. Now, uh, a very complex picture up here. I'll, I'll, try and, uh, I'll try and walk through it as best as we can. We've got two, essentially two separate bits in here. But this is the way the SOSA architecture works for cloud test. You have over here on the left the cloud test 
tool, and that consists of the main environment, the database, and, and some of the real-time analytics. And because we sit out in the cloud, or because we are a web application, it means that people anywhere in your network or anywhere globally can log in and work. You're not restricted to being in the office on that machine. Uh, the other thing to, uh, that we pride ourselves on is the fact that everything is saved within the tool. So all of your test scripts, all of your test scenarios, and all of your results are all together in one place. So you've got one single version of the truth. Everybody can see that within the organization. Then when it comes to running a test, uh, why go through the effort of having to pr procure your own hardware just to load for a load test? This is why we call cloud test. Why not use the cloud? Gone are the days of having to rack up 15 different machines or get a big set of virtual machines in, in a rack somewhere just to be able to do your load testing. Why not just spin them up in the cloud in an automated fashion across, across locations and across cloud providers as well? and use those to test where your users are based. If your users are globally, why are you gonna test from inside your network when you can test from the countries where your users are based and see the geographic influence of, of, on performance? Then we've got the, uh, the yellow dotted line, which I'll, I'll sit and talk about, is it's, it's great using our analytics, our real-time information to, to talk about the response times or the bandwidth or the errors but what's happening to the, the back-end system? It's, it's great saying we're seeing one-second response time, but if everything's running hot at 90 to 100% CPU, then that's not going to be sustainable. So what we, what we talk about here is having the monitoring inbuilt in real time while you're testing. So you see the different layers of the architecture. You see where the bottlenecks are in real time. You have your dev teams, your ops teams, your test teams, all looking at it all at the same time and understanding what's happening before the test is finished. Gone are the days of uh, a, a project manager coming over to a tester and saying, well, okay, when are you running a test? Yeah, I'm running today at 12. Oh, when will I have the results? I'll get you a report by tomorrow. You can have everybody there and seeing what's happening in real time. So continuous quality is much more than unit testing. So somebody checks in a piece of code uh, Jenkins runs its unit tests as normal. Then it can spin up the suitable environments, it could spin up the test environment, it could spin up the stage environment. If you've got environments hosted in the cloud and environments managed using the cloud, and run iterative load tests, understand the performance of this code change, trend that against the previous release, see if you're, you're having any differences there. Then if it's on mobile, run a suite of mobile automation tests against it as well. They can be in isolation or they can be taking place whilst the performance test is happening. So you see the, uh, the results of a fully loaded back-end system on what that means to the, the individual users. Finally, uh, get at the information. You know, if something fails, you want to see what it is. You want to be able to identify where that bottleneck is, isolate that issue so that it can be fixed. And uh, these tests, these builds can go on at night, every night. These builds could go on every hour. These builds can be scheduled as and when to fit your development environment to make sure you're building as quickly as you're able to and, and validating as quickly as you're able to. Finally, manage to a performance baseline. Once you've got your performance baseline of the application that's gone out, because you would have to have been happy with it before you released. Then all of the changes measure against that, trend against that. Are you making it better when you're making these changes or is there a performance impact of these changes? Then finally, once it's gone out into the real world, it's to measure the real user data. And we'll, we'll come on to uh, social real user monitoring in a second. But feeding in the real behavior that real people are seeing is the best way to define your requirements for your next lot of testing. So real user data, uh, this is once it's gone out into the world, uh, you can come and see this on the stand at the back uh, later on, but uh, you want to know what the response times are being seen by the customers. Uh, you want to know what browsers they're using. You want to know of the customers that are coming to us, how many are completing a journey. Uh, and the real user measurement 
side of our uh, platform is really there to answer, help you answer three questions. It's how fast are we? And because it's real user measurement and because we're measuring every user's every iteration, every hit to the page, every, every app step, uh, every app action, you know exactly what's happening for all of your users and how fast you are. We don't use an average in the same way that synthetic monitoring might. We use the real average. We take the median load time because we've captured all of the information, so all of the information is there. Why wouldn't you use that? And it means that you can use any percentile that you wish and, and have that full understanding. Then the next question is, how quick do we need to be? Or how quick do we think we need to be? And then you can start to look at things such as bounce rate. So how many of your users come to the site and then leave straight away because the performance is bad? At what point in performance are you hitting too many people leaving the site? Or it could be if, if the response times are slow, people aren't going through the checkout, so you can measure that. Or it could be how many people are clicking through to a, the third party site that you're hoping that they click through to if the performance is bad at bringing back those results. Then finally, it's what you can change. So how to, be, how to make that, that change and how to become quicker. And there you can start looking at the net, where the time breakdown is for these users, whether it's in time spent in the front end render, rendering, or whether it's a back end time, whether it's DNS resolution, D TCP times. And you can start to, to drill in and understand what areas of, of future development there might be. So just to finish up on the, the the process side of things, I mean, if we if we look at it at the moment, this is the, tra the traditional software development lifecycle. You have development up front with some unit testing, then you have a long window of testing. First your functional testing, then your performance, then your UAT, and then you go live, and there may be some live testing, there may not, which is why we've got that shaded, and that takes a long time. And by the time you're finding the, the defects down at the performance testing side, that's a long way down the chain to then go back to development and need to start that again, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. The way the market is going with DevOps means that we can really compress that, but the key thing you've got to remember with DevOps is you need tests in along the way as well. The earlier you start testing and the earlier you start testing in all the different methods, the quicker you're going to be able to turn around these changes, the quicker you're going to be able to iterate through this iterative process. It's always been an iterative process, but it's just how long that used to be. With the DevOps side and with the test, it means that you can really compress those timelines and make multiple changes and multiple revisions in the time it would normally take you to do one release. So to talk a little bit about SOS to customers, uh, the, one of our, our big customers that has really sort of embraced the DevOps test lifestyle and, and really sort of taken it on wholeheartedly is uh, FIS Mobile. They are a, a very big company out in the States that uh, create mobile banking apps. And I think they've got over, they cover over 1,200 uh, 1200 banks. So they have one big platform, different flavors for all of the banks. And, and what they've managed to do is quite astounding. I think you'll all agree. So there were 250 hours of manual tests that were running for each release that they now run in just one hour every night via automation. This is all done, triggered, and scheduled through Jenkins. The regression tests are not run until the feature request, sorry, until the feature uh, run. It's gone from four months to overnight for this, for the regression testing. They're fixing the bugs earlier because as soon as that code is checked in, it's getting tested and it's getting fed back in that continuous loop. And there's a 25%, they found a 25% reduction in time to market and, and a reduced set of field failures. So it's more stable, it's quicker, and it takes less effort. It's the way forwards. So the path to continuous testing, there's five key points here. First of all, you need to understand your requirements. 
so many times have, have I gone into customers in the past where they've not really required the, you know, they've not really defined the requirements of what they're looking to achieve, what they want to achieve with their continuous testing. And, and without that focus and without that work up front, you're going to fail because the requirements will be ever changing. Once you've understood your requirements, you can then start to understand where the cloud can give you advantages. You know, the cloud enables you to scale very quickly and relatively cheaply as well. Um, if you want to bring up a live, live size production environment in the cloud, you don't have to go and buy all of this equipment, get it all set up. You bring it up for your day, your week, could be your hour once you've got the, the process tuned. And as I said before, you're never going to automate everything. What you need to do is focus, first of all, on the, the high priority, the high traffic. Go back to the 80-20 rule that 80% of your traffic or 80% of your, your use will probably come from 20% of the functionality. Look at what those key business processes are. Look at what those key functions or those critical areas are and automate those first. Then as you start to find problems in other areas through manual testing and through other testing, keep increasing that, that suite uh, of automated tests and build and build and build. So as your functionality grows, as your feature list grows, so does your, so does your automated test suite. Once you've gone through the effort of creating those automated tests, then, then you need to be running them frequently. The more frequent you run them, the, the more confidence you'll have in the quality of your software. So what better way than to connect to a, a, a continuous process such as a Jenkins where you can manage it and you can manage it along with the build process, along with the deployment. Everything can be managed and, and loop round in that continuous way. Finally, align teams with actionable information. This goes back to the, the dev and the test and the ops, all being on the same team, all working towards that same goal. If everybody's got that information, they can work collaboratively and find the solution quicker and start to bring better quality into the software. That's everything from me today. Um, has anybody got any questions about what we covered? Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the f uh, I'll cover the first question first. Uh, so the real user monitoring. How is it that we capture that real user information? So that's done by uh, it's a piece of open source code uh, called Boomerang. It was developed by uh, somebody that now works for Sosta on our Impulse team, and uh, that JavaScript snippet fires off information about the, the performance, uh, the the load times and also other information about the browser, the operating system, the geographic location, things like that. That combined with our real-time analytics is what allows you to see it all in real time and, and really get the best out of that information. Uh, the second question was about how we test on real mobile devices. So uh, other people in the market test with optical recognition. Uh, rather than going down the route of optical recognition, what we do instead is we inject a small library of uh, a small library into the app source and it means we see everything at an object level so we're not looking at, at some pixels colored pixels on a screen we're looking at that by the button name that has been given to it by the developer so if that's the pay button we see that as the pay button so if we need to validate that the pay button's there we can search for the pay button visible on the screen the great thing about that as well is it means it adds to the robustness of our, our script our clips because if that button moves an inch on optical recognition that script will fail whereas for us if that button moves an inch and that's not something that we need to validate against because it's just you know it's it's something that's been decided it won't fail and it means that it leads to far more robust and reusable clips that last a lot longer any other questions oh yep So for performance testing, we're using, uh, sorry, the question first of all, <laughs> uh, what are we using for performance testing and security testing? So Sosta Cloud Test is what we use for our performance testing. Uh, it's Sosta's own tool for performance. It's built around the ability to scale very quickly 
using the utilizing the cloud and utilizing grids of servers to, to do that load generation and also around a great in-memory analytics engine that means you see those results in real time as the test is going on, which is why a number of our customers feel confident to test in production because what we're showing them is what's happening at that point. Uh, with regards to security testing or penetration testing, that isn't something that is done by SOSTA. We have partners uh, in various geographies, it depends where you all are, that, that we were partner with to, to do that process. That's great. Any other questions? No? Fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for your time.